Well, for me, the time during my coma was more intense than real life, so to speak. You lie in your sick bed and you don't move at all. You're lying there and in front of other people, you just look like you're sleeping. But in reality, you are... Well, I was more out and about than ever before. I went traveling. I was out and about. Miss Houter, you had experiences at the brink of death that had long-lasting effects on your life, and it changed it radically. Would you tell us what happened? In 2012, I got very sick. I had a lung embolism, or rather several lung embolisms. The whole lung was full of peripheral and central lung embolisms. And I had an inferior vena cava syndrome due to a venous thrombosis. Vena cava is the large abdominal vein directly in front of the spine. And I must have lived with this for quite some time, because I always had problems catching my breath. And one day I went to a singing event with my daughter in a small town at Lake Constance. Suddenly I collapsed because I couldn't breathe anymore and my daughter, who was 13 at the time, called an ambulance. They picked me up from the road because they could already see that I was about to pass away. They told my daughter, please say your farewells to your mother, but properly. At the time, they also assumed that I wouldn't survive the drive to the hospital because I didn't have oxygen in my blood anymore. And after that, I was in a coma for about two months and I spent a total of eight months in hospital. I had a multi-organ failure. One organ after another just stopped working, and I had to be re-operated 12 times. Meaning, they cut me open, got the organ out, put it back, and then it started bleeding, and they had to open me up again. How did you experience this time in hindsight? Because from the outside, a coma looks like a time of complete unconsciousness. Well, for me, the time during my coma was more intense than real life, so to speak. You lie in your sick bed and you don't move at all. You're lying there and in front of other people, you just look like you're sleeping. But in reality, you are... Well, I was more out and about than ever before. I went traveling. I was out and about. Actually, there were three layers of reality in parallel. There was the reality of my immediate family who had to watch me die and who couldn't make contact with me because I wasn't responsive anymore. And then there was the reality of the doctors who tried to do everything to keep me alive somehow, who invested a lot in me. They got the devices, the medication, I received 28 liters of blood. And then there was my own reality, which was completely different. I wasn't just vegetating in my bed, but I was very active. I was constantly traveling. When you said that you experienced the realities of the doctors and your next of kin, does that mean you noticed when you had visitors or what the doctors were doing? Were you conscious of everything around you? Conscious might be the wrong word here. It wasn't like the consciousness you experience in everyday life. Like when you say it's got 25 degrees Celsius and it's summer. On the contrary, it's more some sort of consciousness that on one hand is way sharper and directed towards other things. And on the other hand, it is not something like a sleeping or dream state. It's definitely different because it feels extremely real. When my next of kin were able to speak to me again after I'd woken up from the coma, they said, you were lying in bed for two months. But I couldn't believe this, because to me, my experiences had been so intense in those two months, that to me, 
Well, you can't put it in time. Because time and space weren't valid anymore. Because they were denser and stronger and more intense than consciousness in everyday life. People often say that you step out of your body. Well, in my experience, it was more like I was everywhere and at the same time. Well, this simultaneity of space and time, that's what made this whole experience so intense. Let me try to explain it with the help of an example. It's a little difficult to speak about it, because it was an extra-linguistic experience. And if you try to articulate it, it always seems dull somehow. Anyway, quite at the beginning of my coma, I had an experience. Well, they weren't individual experiences, but it was a certain experience that is easier for me to describe because it stands out. I was in an incredibly white room. Well, it was... It's best to compare it with a castle hall with floor-level windows. And a very bright light was coming in from all sides at the same time. It was different from normal life, where light comes in from one side, and it glitters and dazzles you. But this light was very bright at the same time and not dazzling. It covered me and it was soft and protecting and warm. And the light was omnipresent. And this light was accompanied by incredibly beautiful music. And this music carried me. It was so enticing. This light, this warmth, this music. It was like being carried somewhere. And at the same time, I could feel that my daughter was standing behind me. My daughter didn't want me to walk into the light. And she pulled on me. She was holding on to me. And at that moment, I could decide whether I wanted to give myself to the light, which was incredibly tempting, or if I followed my daughter's wish to stay here. This decision was very difficult. But in the end, I was able to make up my mind. It would have been easy to let go and indulge myself in it, but I decided to stay here. At that moment, I also started my journey back into life, which was very hard and turned out to be the most difficult phase of my illness. This journey back. Dying isn't hard. It's a light and beautiful feeling, and there's no need to be scared of it. But the journey back and to distance oneself from this, what felt like a sort of universal awareness or consciousness, this awareness felt like as if I could give up those painstakingly maintained boundaries between me and others, and to give myself to a sort of overall awareness, which would have welcomed me with great joy and ease. And instead, I withdrew, and I tried to rebuild those boundaries, and to separate my own consciousness from this universal consciousness or awareness that wanted to welcome me. And that was very difficult. It was hard work to separate myself from this. After waking up from the coma, I also went through a phase where I panicked a lot. And I had difficulties feeling my own body again and the boundaries of my own body. Meaning, I had the feeling I was scattered all over the room. Just to give you an example, I was wondering why my lower body was lying on my neighbor's bed. That's something I did not understand at the time. And I didn't feel my boundaries. This affected my psychological, but also my physical boundaries. And I really had to make an effort to put all the pieces together again in order to take part in life again. And this phase was very difficult. The phase of leaving, however, was very easy.
Just earlier, you were speaking of several journeys. Would you be able to summarize what you had experienced during that time? Indeed, I was properly out and about. I was on the go all the time, and most of the time I was flying. It wasn't like what you'd imagine, like an angel-like being. Once I even flew in a MiG, like properly, with the speed of 10G. I even felt this incredible speed that carried me away, and I was, I was far, far away. I was in Norway, I was in Africa. One of the experience was, at the time I was actually in Africa, and my mother, who was always sitting at my sick bed, told me that this was probably happening during the phase when nursing assistants from Africa were looking after me. I must have sensed and processed that in my journey. And for some time I also claimed I was in Spain, and I felt everything physically. Well, at least I experienced it physically. In other words, it was not a psychotic imaginary journey, but I really experienced it. I can describe you where I'd been to. I went to lakes and went along them on a train. I saw those things. I spoke to people. I was able to understand them, although the people around me, when I was in Spain, I spoke Spanish. I was able to understand the language, and I could talk about the conversations afterwards. And I was very fortunate, because during the first phase after my illness, pastoral workers came to the hospital, and they really took me seriously and listened to me attentively. When I became more mobile using the wheelchair, I was with the nursing assistants in the intensive care ward for two months. And they took all those things very seriously. In contrast to the psychologists and psychiatrists I was speaking with, they just dismissed it as a psychosis. An actual experience, meaning you didn't just know in which country you were, you even knew the geographical position. It was real. You were able to verify them and also did that afterwards? Interestingly enough, I never got the idea to look for those places on a map, because to me it was so obvious that these places were real. But it's a good idea. I should do that sometime. It's a good idea. But to me, it was just so obvious, it was so real. Even until now, it's hard for me to believe that I never left this bed, because I did leave it. I was outside, I was far away. In fact, it was as physically real as if I pinched my arm. A question in terms of time. Does the time you were traveling appear longer than the time you spent in bed or vice versa? Did you have the notion that comparatively a lot of earthly time had passed? It's both at the same time. When I was released from hospital, I was surprised that I had lost quite a big slice of my life. I was sent to hospital in early summer, and when I was released, it was winter, late winter. And I know things like, for example, I also realized for the first time how we define the passing of time, right? The experiences we have. Like during Christmas, you go to the Christmas market. In autumn, you eat plum cake and so on. That was the piece that was missing. And this piece of time I had missed out on couldn't possibly be reconstructed. At the same time, I received a gift that was beyond time and space. And then this gift was a lot bigger. Well, it was both at the same time. There was a lot more time and simultaneously I missed the time in my actual surroundings. Were you able to cope well with these experiences, to grasp the things that had happened? How did you process all of these experiences? Well, during the first phase after waking up from my coma, they moved me from the intensive care ward to a single room because they wanted to do something good for me. But I was completely in panic in this room, because at first I didn't know what had happened. Of course, everybody else knew about it, and they'd say, you've made it, you're alive. But at the time, things just started for me. Like, what happened to me? Oh my god, you almost died. And at the same time, my body had changed drastically. 
I had almost lost 20 kilograms. I wasn't able to walk anymore. I was just so exhausted. I couldn't hold anything. I couldn't swallow. I couldn't speak, which was particularly difficult because I wanted to tell people so many things and I couldn't. I had to relearn everything from scratch. And in that situation, I was in the single room where also nobody had access to me. I was so in panic and I had to conquer everything once again. On the other hand, I had received a gift. And that's the main thing that carries me through life now. I received the gift to learn what life is really about. When they got me out of this intensive care ward, I asked the nursing assistants if they could show me the sky. And they were so kind. They actually wheeled me. I was lying in my bed, you know, I wasn't able to get up at the time. So they wheeled me to the edge of the room so I could have a glimpse at the sky. And the sky was like the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. I felt so in peace just watching the sky. I remember it was beautiful blue sky and it was an incredibly intense experience. It was like experiencing, I'm alive and life is just beautiful. And this feeling carries me through life now. I experience it every morning now. I wake up and think, life, you're here and I'm allowed to experience you. I'm allowed to feel the air. I'm allowed to meet other people. I'm allowed to feel disappointment and pain. In other words, death or this constant closeness to death which I experienced for two months, it gave me life and showed me its value. Namely, that it is the most precious thing we have. And I remember when they allowed me to let water flow over my arms for the first time. Having water flow over your hands is something that is incredibly wonderful. And this experience has stuck to me. But something else happened as well. Actually, two things happened. I'm not afraid anymore. Fear just stayed in this fragile, shivering and scared being that was in the sick bed. I left this behind, this fear that accompanies you through life. Am I doing the right thing or can I be the person that I really am? Now I can really live the life that's in me. And that's actually the most important message. That's also the reason why I wanted to be in this show. I'd like to tell people that there is no reason to be scared of anything. Live what's in you. What's in you is worth something, even if it seems small and insignificant to you. It's not about piling up possessions. It's not about living in a great house. It's not about wearing even greater jewelry or to drive a greater car or about having greater travel experiences. It's about being who you really are. And that can be difficult. I made this experience after my illness because I actually changed everything. No stone remained on the other. Just imagine. Before my illness, I was the successful wife of a businessman, so to speak. We had a very big house of 360 square meters, two big cars in front of the house, beautiful antiques. It was everything as it was supposed to be. And this life didn't seem important to me anymore. Meaning, I didn't understand why it was important to have two cars, although we only needed one. Why it was important to live on 30, 60 square meters, when 50 square meters are enough for one person. And why it was important to pile up all these possessions. These things were just not important to me anymore. I just didn't understand what those things were for. I just didn't have any understanding for it anymore. I had to change change my life. I'd like to compare it with, do you know those toys for children, where children, for example, try to push a cube through a certain shaped hole? And to me, it felt a bit like having to push a cube through a triangle. Well, I just didn't fit into my old life anymore. It's not something I chose to do, but it just wasn't possible anymore. But in fact, I always used to be this cube, but before my illness, 
I'd been something like dough. I let myself shape and push into the triangular hole. Now I am this cute. I'm sure it was pretty painful to see for the people around me, because I didn't fit into this life anymore. I also broke up with my husband, because he just couldn't understand it anymore. I'm also terribly sorry, but I couldn't do anything about it. I really think that if you've gone through a near-death experience, you realize how precious your own life is, or how little you need to be afraid of things. After such an experience, it's not possible to live a trivial life anymore. Although, viewed from the outside, my life is more trivial now than it used to be. I live in a small rental apartment, and I don't have a great job anymore. Before, I'd been the head of communications, meaning I consulted the company's communications. And now, I'm just doing something insignificant. I assist in a doctor's surgery and help people who suffer from addictions because it's important to me to show them how important life is. And this is something that seems meaningful to me. I can't do something that doesn't seem meaningful anymore because life's too short and too important. You mentioned earlier that no stone remained on the other. How vast were those changes? Were there things that only had a chance to develop after you'd made this experience? I think that's why I got so sick, because I lived against myself so much. I didn't have an easy childhood. I was adamant that my life would turn out to be perfect, that everything would be great from the outside. At least that was how I imagined a perfect life to be, having a husband, a child, a dog, a cat, and a big house. You know, a life that looks perfect from the outside. Financially secure. And I completely overlooked that this wasn't me, and that I wanted to live a totally different life. And then I decided to change everything. I gave up my job. At the time, I was the press officer of an IT company. And I always wrote that everything was even bigger and more beautiful. You know, the typical press officer language. That's something I just couldn't do anymore, because it seemed phony to me. And I also realized that I couldn't live with a man anymore, and that I was attracted to women. I finally admitted that to myself, which was very hard for me at the time, because I was afraid to be rejected by society and to lose all those social connections. And I really hadn't been aware that I had this in me. I needed this near-death experience to be able to be myself, because I had so many fears. I was suffering from that many fears that I was less scared from death than from life. And finally, this was reversed. I can live my life now, and I'm not afraid of death. You spoke about a big responsibility that developed as a result of the near-death experience, which had major effects on your life. Do you mean we should really do what life is asking us to do? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. Well, I had to learn it the hard way, in that sense that I almost lost myself, my body and this life. But in return, I got to see something. Namely, I got the opportunity that my consciousness or awareness became part of a bigger awareness, and that I can't just act against what is in me. But on the contrary, that I'm part of a bigger awareness, that I have a responsibility, a duty, to foster this and live it, because one day I'll become... Not only one day, I already am part of this awareness. Well, I always try to explain it like that. This door that opened up for me during this near-death experience. This door never fully closed again. It's like there was a thin curtain, and this curtain I'm able to draw back when I meditate. Then I can feel this overall awareness again. When I take part in everyday life, it's not with me all the time. But when I meditate, 
I can pull back this curtain and sometimes I've got the feeling that I'm part of a much bigger awareness all of a sudden. Well, I really don't mind if I call this bigger awareness God or if I get to a Zen awareness during my meditation. I really feel indifferent about the term because I think it's always meant to be the same thing. But this thing this awareness that I carry in my everyday life, no matter if I call it me or self, that's my responsibility to foster, so to speak. That's something that was given to me, and I can't just live a life that isn't mine or that isn't me. That's the responsibility I have. All in all, how did your experience affect your idea of man? What is your conclusion in this regard? What is the meaning of life? To me, the meaning of life is life itself, meaning life in all its forms. I always find it quite funny when people say life's purpose is to be happy or something along those lines. That's not true. Life has to be lived in all shapes and forms. Pain and misfortunes are part of that. These aspects are also part of my life now. So my life hasn't become easier, but I've become more aware. I think to confront these aspects of life and to savor them fully, that's the meaning of life. And in this sense, we can contribute something to this overall awareness later on. In other words, I won't stop to exist, but I'll give something back. Death and the process of dying are widely tabooed in our society. Many people are very scared of death. Would you be able to give us a piece of advice or a recipe for easing this fear? Well, I wouldn't be able to give you a recipe as such. And I'm not purified and know everything about life now. I'm still a human that's been thrown into this world as every other human too. I just learned that even that is life. And I think it's possible to see death as a joyful part of it and something natural. It's not the opposite of life, but it's the fulfillment of life, so to speak. But I can only speak for myself in this regard, so I don't know what death is like for other people. I just know what it was like for me, if I may say so. It's the final completion of life. And if I manage to live a fulfilling life, which doesn't mean that I have to win the Nobel Prize, but it's more about being aware of the here and now, to be fully here, then I don't need to be afraid of death, because death isn't the opposite of life. It is the fulfillment or completion of life. And that is what makes life worth living. In other words, it is where it is leading me towards. And at the same time, it is what tells me to take care of my life. It is the most precious thing you have. Ms. Hauter, thank you for being so open and that you were willing to share your experiences with us. Many thanks for this interview.